This portrait is of Elizabeth Wright, who is a professor of biochemistry at UW-Madison and also affiliated with the Morgrids Institute for Research. She is also the director of a new cryo-electron microscope, or cryo-EM, facility here at the UW. I got the chance to talk with Elizabeth about her research and her role as director and sharing some of our conversation here. So, can you tell me about your research in this new facility to get us started? Okay, so I started at UW two years ago, and they wanted to build a, well, what they thought was a small cryo facility, and so then I said, well, if you really want to do this, let's think bigger, and so they decided, okay. So we have been building this cryo-EM facility all during the COVID downturn. Wow, what does that entail? What kind of things do you have to put into this lab? So it was basically two years to get the design for the spaces and the renovation done. Mm -hmm. So because we're working at liquid nitrogen temperatures, we have to make sure that we're in a humidity and temperature controlled space so that we don't have a lot of condensate and ice forming on the specimens as we're doing transfers and different things. They also have to be in acoustically shielded rooms, electromagnetically isolated rooms, mm -hmm. vibration canceled rooms. So they're not like microscopes. They're oh, yeah. So we have four of these instruments. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. At the same time we were doing the space renovations, we also ordered the microscope. So it takes nine months to a year for it to be built because mm -hmm. these are hand-built instruments. Mm -hmm. And there's one engineer that is set to each instrument, follow the entire build of it through the process. Then once they're built, then they're shipped here to then build them back up again. And so that process of building them back up and then tuning them up can take, you know, a couple of weeks to two months to get them all tuned in and, and happy. And so then we're still tweaking things because once we start actually doing work, then we're tuning different aspects of the microscope so that then we are getting the best performance out of them. Can you discuss how these cryo electron microscopes work? Sure. So what we do is really kind of simple. We take, let's say, an aqueous solution. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have a protein or bacteria in all volume of buffer. And then we have an EM grid, which is about a three millimeter. So a little bit bigger than this tip of this pin. Mm -hmm. And so it has a mesh structure that can be copper, gold, other object. You also put a carbon film. And so on that carbon film, we typically like it to have perforations in it mm -hmm. because ideally once your sample is suspended on the grid, you're going to image through the holes in the film. So when you have your sample on your grid, you have put your four microliters of sample to it. You've blotted it with a little bit of filter paper, then you plunge freeze it in liquid ethane. And the liquid ethane has a much faster freezing rate than liquid nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And so this is why we prefer to use it. It's in milliseconds that it freezes, then you transfer it to liquid nitrogen, and then you store it in liquid nitrogen forever. We have grids that have been stored for, gosh, now 12 years, and we could still image them in the microscope. They would look as good today as they did 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. So then once you have your frozen grids, you take them under liquid nitrogen to a loading station. So then once they're in the microscope, you're just running through them and collecting your data, either in what we term single particle data collection mode or tomography. So with this cryo-EM, you're shining a beam of electrons at your sample. And the idea is that these electrons will provide a better resolution than normal light? Yeah, so theoretically, you should always be able to achieve atomic level resolution. In actuality, this goal for biological EM has only recently been achieved. So there's like three papers that came out within the last month that showed angstrom level resolution. So people can see the hydrogen atoms, you That's know, cool. which is wow. insane. Yeah. yeah. But a lot depends on the sample the imaging conditions, the type of detector you have with doing imaging. It's important what you put in, but it's also important what's sensing the signal. You know, then in single particle cryo-EM, what you do is you have thousands of those particles spread across a grid. They're all unique. They're all tumbling in space. So you can theoretically get all 360 degree views of them. Yeah. If you extract thousands of those particles and then average them together to get your single particle average. And this is where the 
atomic level resolution work has been achieved. The second approach that we use more commonly in my lab because we're interested in looking at pleomorphic viruses or bacterial cells or whatever because everyone's a unique individual uh -huh. is tomography. And so tomography, I don't know if you've ever had a CT or an MRI scan. Yeah, I have. So it's the same principle where if you're in the scanner, the scanner is revolving around you, right? And yep. taking that 360 degree view in the electron microscope, we can't do 360 yet, but we can tilt plus minus maximally 70 degrees. Mm -hmm. So at each degree we're interested in, we take an image. Yeah. And so we use the same computational algorithm as in CT to generate the three-dimensional volume. And so this capacity really have facilitated people's work in developing new vaccines, new drug targets, therapeutics. I mean, there's a huge amount of work in the field directed right now towards coronavirus. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, there was a period that almost every day a paper was coming out on a structure. Yeah. It's, and so this is really critical when we think of the structural components of that virus and the things that are interacting with us and mm -hmm. as a host. The one most in particular is on the surface, they have a glycoprotein. You may have heard people talking about it, spike. And so spike interacts with the ACE2 receptor. Mm -hmm. And so it comes in, binds, and allows the virus to fuse with the host cell. Yeah. What are some other research plans that the UW has to use these cryo EMs? So there's tons of ways that these microscopes can be used on campus. I mean, obviously infectious disease is a huge one and will be ever present. Uh, neuroscience and neurodegenerative diseases. There's also basic biology work or relatable to energy research. So we have collaborators in the, the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center. Cancer biology, we have a lot of people in cancer biology who have targets that they're waiting for us to say, the microscope's ready and, and they'll be collecting data and processing it. So it's really unlimited. So this microscope uses electrons to image. Do you use any techniques with light with these cryo EMs? As you were talking about, you know, light microscopy and polarized light and stuff, one of the big emphasis areas in the field is how do we correlate with other techniques. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the big technique we've spent a lot of time thinking about is how we correlate well with light microscopy. So in EM, we don't have all the green fluorescent protein and all the flavors of tools to be able to yeah. label a biological object. To be able to blend those techniques where basically we can fluorescently tag things, you know, with protein fusions and light microscopy, image them by fluorescence microscopy, plunge freeze that sample, mm -hmm. image it again under cryofluorescence microscopy so that we can find all the particular positions on a grid surface of a cell or a virus infected cell, then transfer that sample into the EM. And then we have that coordinate map that we can use to find those positions of interest to then collect the cryo data. So we've been working a lot to develop the tools and techniques to allow us to work with cells in this manner and viruses and other objects so that we can get better data. So outside of research, do you have any creative outlets that you enjoy? So I'll tell you that it's kind of fun to talk to you because I also have a love for art as well. And maybe this is why I'm a good microscopist. So when I was an undergrad, in addition to doing all my science stuff, I also took a lot of art courses mm -hmm. because I was trying to decide what is the career trajectory and then what is hobby. Yeah. And so yeah. Sci science became the career trajectory and art is the hobby. So typically I like to draw and paint, typically pencil drawing or using pastels or chalks. If I'm thinking about painting, it's acrylic or oil. I take a lot of pictures too, mm -hmm. being a microscopist. And I'm looking for things that then maybe I could paint in the future, so taking different pictures. Typically it's landscape or, mm -hmm. or nature things for me. I have drawn and painted people before, but that's not normally what I'm doing. I'm more of a nature person and yeah. very much more on the realist side mm -hmm. versus abstract. Very cool. How did you get interested in science? And what do you think is important for this generation's young aspiring scientists? My dad was in the army, so we lived a lot of places growing up. I went to 
well over 13 schools before graduating high school. Wow. Uh, so we lived a lot of different places. And the big thing for me, and probably why I'm a biologist, is just a love of the natural world. Mm -hmm. Really wanting to understand how we fit into it and how different systems work. And so we did a lot of hiking. We did a lot of outdoors things. And my parents were really great at supporting us and being able to question the world around us and being able mm -hmm. to investigate the world around us. I, you know, the first time I was asked when we lived in Colorado at one point, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, well, I want to be an artist and a barrel racer and potentially a veterinarian. You know, so <laughs> even when you ask small children what they want to be, I wonder if those trajectories can even continue. Yeah. When we would go to different places in the world, I mean, we spent a good bit of time in Egypt and Israel, just exploring, even to understand how humans have evolved over time. Yeah. So going and seeing all the ancient ruins and understanding those cultures, I think is really important to help build people's minds to question. I think that that's the thing that's important to really engage with children is to help them thoughtfully question things. In 10 years time, what's your vision for your research and this cryo EM lab? I guess there's two fronts here. As an educator, one of the things that's beyond what we do in the biology we're studying is inspiring those next generations of scientists to be better or do more than I have. Mm -hmm. My goal is always to, within the context of my group or the facility, be pushing the limits of what we're doing mm -hmm. so that we're expanding our capabilities so that anyone who's coming from the group can be doing more in the future. So one is to continue to make sure that that's the environment that we strive for and achieve within any chunk of time. If we're thinking about the microcosm of the research program, I mean, our real goal is, you know, since we work in infectious disease, that we really are in understanding the structures of these systems or particular components of them. Mm -hmm so that we're working with other groups to develop targeted drugs to better our futures in mankind so that then we don't have pandemic like what's going on and then we're left without having solutions really rapidly available. So those are the two main aspects. Would you also hope that this facility is known worldwide? I think we're already internationally recognized. Oh, awesome. Yes, yeah, even without opening our doors then the goal is to continue to have that status. <laughs> Very cool. Okay. You know, this is where pushing the boundaries of what we're doing with the technology so that we stay at the top of our game. Because with the vision of what we've been doing, we wouldn't have been able to recruit the three junior PIs that we have. They're leaders in their respective disciplines. That's awesome. You know, are there any other facilities that have four bio? Yeah. Oh, sure. The unique aspect here is to be installing four high-end microscopes at one time mm. is not the norm. <laughs> <laughs> Normally people are doing one or two at a time, but this, this was pretty intense. Well, this was awesome to talk to you. Thanks so much for taking some time. Oh, sure. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you. Sure.